with the Defence Select Committee Chair, Tobias Elwood, has warned that how we handle the current situation between Russia and Ukraine could determine the security of Europe for decades. It's frightening, isn't it? It comes as a senior US official says Putin could use a false pretext to invade Ukraine at any moment. That's the way he's phrased it. Armed Forces Minister James Heapy joins us now. Are we Morning. in that situation? Could it happen at any moment realistically, do you think? Yes. I mean, that's a quick and brief uh, and rather frightening answer. What would our response be? Well, I think we've been clear all week. The conditions for uh, Russia to invade Ukraine have been set since the weekend. Uh, all of the uh, combat air support, artillery, missile systems uh, have been in place since then. Uh, and this week, contrary to what we've heard from the Kremlin uh, about troops moving away from the area, what we've seen is bridges being built over the Pirate River between Belarus uh, and Ukraine, a, fi a massive field hospital be constructed, uh, and all of the uh, troops that have been exercising in Belarus uh, and in southern Russia moving towards the border into what would look like um, the positions from which they would uh, launch an attack. So um, I think it is uh, very imminent indeed. I would draw a distinction between imminence and inevitability, though, just because it is imminent and the speed of response from the moment that President Putin takes a decision could just be a matter of hours or even minutes. That doesn't mean it's inevitable. There is a chance that uh, diplomacy can still be successful, and everybody is hoping that that is the case. There's also a chance, worryingly, that President Putin might decide to just maintain this posture around Ukraine uh, and seek to destabilise Ukraine's economy, politics and security with that sort of noose around the neck of Ukraine, if you like. And the West needs to give some thought to how we'll deal with that as well. Well, yeah, I mean, how? Uh, what thought have you, have you given to that? Because that, that is sort of, many people argue, Putin winning by not even starting the war and not even invading, because he's destabilised the group, he's, he's put pressure on tensions between the members of NATO, and if he keeps the troops there, then that will continue. Um, I understand that Britain... It's going to double the size of the British force in Estonia on the border. Um, that's only going from 900 personnel to a bit more, though, isn't it? Uh, it's still a small group. Is there a sense that we will get involved on a stronger level? No, and I think it's really important to be clear that if by a stronger level you mean military mm. action in Ukraine, uh, I think that that would be... Uh, an irresponsible course of action to take, and that's why it's been discounted by everybody at the NATO meeting yesterday. So what, so what um, will our I troops do then if, if, if Russia do invade Ukraine, and let's hope that diplomacy can, can put the end to that, what will our troops be there to try and achieve? Well, that, that I think, is the, um, the key point, that what troop, our troop deployments, and it's not just troops, there's also HMS Diamond sailing shortly for the eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea, uh, we've sent additional Typhoon fighter jets down to RAF Aquitaria in Cyprus in order to uh, be involved in NATO air policing in the Black Sea and Southeast Europe. Um, so across all three services, there's a contribution that we're making to reinforce uh, NATO's eastern flank and to re reassure the easternmost members of the alliance. Within Ukraine itself, I think it's really important, actually, to um, be clear with the Kremlin that NATO is not going to play a role in Ukraine itself. Ukraine is not a member of NATO. It's really important that the line that is Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, that an attack on one is an attack on us all, the sort of collective security clause that's kept us safe all the way through the Cold War, now is definitely not the time to be blurring the lines of that by kind of implying somehow that Ukraine would benefit from that. Um, that, I think, would cause uh, further threat to Putin that is unnecessary and would risk a miscalculation or an escalation. The, the route to deter President Putin, I think, is exclusively through um, the financial and the sort of diplomatic lens, so making him and his ministers pariahs on the world stage uh, and imposing on Russia an incredibly punitive set of sanctions there was, that, don't um... just affect, sorry, just, that don't just affect the Russian government, 
but also affect the kind of the elite of oligarchs around President Putin. Is, is there, yeah. is there okay. any there evidence, was, though, that was... he cares about being a pariah on the stage? Yeah, I think that he... Uh, and I think that part of what he's been up to after the, over the last six months has been to try and get Russia back onto the world stage now. And he has, um, hasn't he? He's, he's achieved right. that. That's a lot of the, the sort of... The questions are about the fact that the, the NATO forces and, and Europeans are, are... Not just the Europeans, but some of our, our, you know, uh, people from across the Atlantic as well are, are jumping to his tune now. And actually, he's holding all the cards. It's exactly what he wanted. Maybe. I mean, I, I think, you know, people have sort of tried to do the sort of gotcha thing, well, haven't we kind of done what he wanted yeah. to and, you know, isn't this therefore a failure of intelligence or whatever? I, I think, look, if, if, if there isn't going to be a war, if this is all some sort of wind-up or hoax or just attempt to uh, get Russia back into the, onto the world stage, then I'll, I'll take that because that saves tens of thousands of lives in what could be an absolutely brutal war between two Tier 1 militaries. Okay. Um, I would just observe, however, that he had that seat at the table with President Biden when there were 50,000 troops on Ukraine's border. He's since built that up to 140,000, plus all of the combat aircraft. He sailed ships around from Amansk, Leningrad and St. Petersburg through the Mediterranean into the Black Sea. That is a hugely expensive thing to do. Yeah. And unfortunately, all of the enablers that have been arriving on the Russian, on the Ukrainian border in the last few days mean that, to me, as I said, very matter-of-factly at the front of the interview, um, I fear that okay. he is still in the process of preparing. There was widespread expectation, wasn't there, that it would be yesterday the invasion happened. That didn't come to pass, thank goodness. But, of course, the Winter Olympics finishes on Sunday. And we know that President Xi met with President Putin at the start of all this. Is there some concern? Is that a date that you're all looking at, just in terms of, actually, he wouldn't invade till the end of the Olympics because that would detract from what's happening in Beijing? So I, I don't think that anybody in London or Washington ever said that Wednesday was the day. Jake Sullivan, the US National Security Advisor, last Friday said that they had had intelligence that instead of it being the end of the Winter Olympics, which I think is when people were expecting it to be, there was intelligence that it may be much sooner. I think it was a leak okay. um, uh, so in Washington. Are you, but that, are you, are you looking at that date on Sunday as potentially, I, actually, that could be a more pertinent opportunity for him? No, I'm not looking at any particular date, to be honest with you, um, not to try and dodge the question, but just the reality is, is the conditions are set right now. In the last 48 hours, we've seen a bridge being built over uh, the Piriot River. Field hospitals are in place. We know that all of the ammunition and fuel uh, and logistics support is in place. Formations are shaking out into their attack positions. Um, so it, it could happen today, tomorrow, it could happen next Wednesday, it could happen in two weeks' time. But the fact is, is that it is very, very imminent, if not inevitable, and that's why diplomacy needs to continue at top speed in order to try and avert what could be utterly catastrophic. OK, well, let's hope that that can happen. Mm. James Heapy, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you.